For everybody that doesn't speak Navajo, my name is Candace French. I am an attorney at Sachs Tyranny. This is um, the basic overview of tribal law in Arizona, just as the title suggests. And so um, I really geared this presentation towards people that have no familiarity at all, zero, um, working in Indian country or that have um, are starting to work in Indian country or that may find themselves in tribal court. Um, so it's really important to me to kind of get, go over some foundational um, federal Indian law and uh, what's a tribe, what's their jurisdiction, and what are their boundaries. So um, for people that are more familiar, please bear with us um, in those parts. But I think, again, it's really important to get the, that foundation um, foundational understanding so that you understand why courts are different, why courts may have jurisdiction or why they may not. The goals of this presentation are really to just give you a basic um, overview and basic facts about American Indian tribes, uh, their legal status, and the structure of their governments, which all implicate how um, their tribal courts may function. Uh, next is to describe or give you the definition of what Indian country is, because that also implicates um, what they what tribes have jurisdiction over. Next, I uh, wanted to give you just kind of a brief overview of instances where where someone can find themselves in a tribal court setting um, for legal matters that address these four areas. I mean, you can end up in tribal court for various reasons, um, but these are kind of the four general areas that I figured most people end up in, in tribal courts. That would be criminal matters for sure. Um, next would be business matters. So having some kind of relation, business relationship with a tribe or a tribal entity um, and a dispute arises where it needs to be handled in tribal court. Next would be family or any domestic matters. Um, this is a really huge section um, and it includes a lot of sub, sub, uh, sub areas like uh, marriage and divorce, child custody, uh, guardianship, you name it, kind of all falls under the family and domestic matters. And finally, probate matters will sometimes land you in court. Um, finally, at the end, I hope to provide you with a few resources that will help you um, navigate the tribal court system if you're going at it at a, alone, or if you decide to retain some kind of counsel where you can find people that practice in Indian country. So, ne so next, um, basic facts about American Indians and tribes. So the Federal Register um, every year lists all the tribes that are recognized by the United States federal government. Um, usually it will increase like one or two a year. I remember the last time I actually looked at the Federal Register, it was 565 and now it's 574. And so this tells you that every year tribes are gaining federal recognition either by administrative process or through a congressional act. So this is uh, the most recent uh, Federal Register uh, that I found, and that's 85 FR 5462 from earlier in this year, listing 574 federally recognized tribes. Right now in Arizona, there are 22 federally recognized Indian tribes. Um, if you didn't know that there are that many, there are, and I will show you a map a little later of where those tribes are located. But together, these 22 tribes occupy over 19 million acres of land. That's just a little over a quarter of the Arizona land base. Um, but Arizona tribes do possess a greater percentage of land than any other state within the United States. And in, if you take a bird's eye view, there's um, American Indians control 56 million acres across the United States. So the legal status of American Indian tribes is important because, again, federal rec recognition um, is a special legal and political designation that creates this government-to-government -government relationship with the federal government. Um, in previous court cases, tribes were recognized as domestic dependent nations um, and a fiduciary responsibility was imposed on the United States. Um, to, to oversee some of those uh, issues that tribes face. Um, recognition also imposes upon the secretary certain obligations um, where tribes will benefit from services um, as well as its members. 
So having federal recognition is very important, again, because it establishes this government to government relationship. And you'll see that this relationship uh, it plays out, especially with in the criminal context, where a tribe um, may need the federal government to prosecute a really heinous crime that they have a limitation on sentencing or may lack jurisdiction over. So you'll see that and it's the responsibility of the United States to prosecute that person for that crime. In addition to the federally recognized tribes, there are also a handful of state recognized tribes and those are, um, like the name implies, tribes that are only recognized by the state. These tribes don't have federal recognition, um, and so they wouldn't be able to partake in that government-to-government -government relationship with the federal government or benefit from those federal acts that um, benefit American Indians. Some of the tribes that are state recognized, you might be familiar with them. Uh, one is the Lumbee tribe over in North Carolina, the Eastern Pequot Tribal Nation, which is in uh, Connecticut, I believe, and the Ade Caddo tribe, which is in Louisiana. Um, and so for the purposes of this presentation, we're only going to focus on the federally recognized tribes in Arizona. Um, there are no state recognized tribes in Arizona right now, and I'm not aware of any. Um, I know there's a few of them that are trying to gain federal recognition, um, but they're not recognized by the state or the federal government. So here's a list of the Indian tribes that are in Arizona. Um, you can see the 22 that are right here, um, and they're situated all over the state. Um, you have like Auchin, you have Cocopa, you have Gila River, Havasupai, Navajo Nation, Salt River, San Carlos, Don Otham, and uh, Yavapai Apache Nation. Um, and some of the tribes share similar cultural um, ideas and some of them are very distinct and you'll see that some of them have huge land bases some of them have very tiny ones where nobody lives on them and some have zero land base and so again land base um, implicates the tribes jurisdiction so here's a map of all of the tribes I stole this from uh, ITCA because they live have a pretty good map and so you'll see that the tribes are located all throughout the state, some of the bigger land-based tribes would be the Navajo Nation, Hopi Tribe, then you have the Tonoff Nation down here, White Mountain, San Carlos, and then you have some smaller tribes um, that are really rural, and those would be, um, where are they? They have the Supai, they're down in the Grand Canyon. Uh, their tribal court is down in the Grand Canyon, and you have to helicopter down there or hike. Some of the tribes are more metro, which would be like, the Salt River, Pima Maricopa Indian Community, um, Gila River is pretty close to the Metropolitan, Auchin is located close to Maricopa, um, and then you have tribes further on this side on the um, California-Arizona border whose land um, extends into California, and then you also have the Navajo Nation up here whose land base um, includes areas in Utah as well as um, New Mexico. And then on this page, I also just took a few snapshots of some of the tribal court buildings. And right here is uh, the Gila River tribal court building. Here's the Ak Chin. Next is uh, one of the Navajo Nation judicial districts in their newer judicial buildings. And I'm, I'll tell you, they don't all look like this. I've uh, been in court in a chapter house in a small room um, with a judge and a client. And so that they don't all look like this if you ever find yourself practicing in tribal court. And then finally at the bottom is the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community um, Judicial Complex, one of the more recent, newer um, judicial complexes, and that's out here on Salt River, which is close to Scottsdale. So tribal governments um, are, like I said, distinct independent political communities, um, and they retain their natural rights to be able to self-govern. Um, Tribes are able to maintain and establish their own forms of government. Um, they're also able to determine their own membership, enact criminal and civil laws, levy taxes, control their property, um, and exercise powers delegated by Congress. And also, and in this case, to adjudicate tribal disputes. With the variation of tribal governments, you also have a variation in their tribal court systems. Um, 
but some of the governments, they look very familiar to the United States' government structure with the three-branch form of government, having a legislative and executive, executive branch and also a judicial branch. Um, and then some tribes uh, don't have that kind of system or set up uh, where they can only, they might only have a tribal council and it has the sole authority. Some may have a tribal council, but also a separate judicial branch. Um, so you'll see a variation throughout the country and throughout Arizona with how tribes are, um, are governed. Tribal governments may also establish government entities to regulate certain areas, such as, you know, the gaming enterprise or tax commission or some other regulatory agency. And so you'll see a lot of times some of these entities will end up in court because they enter into a contract with somebody else or they do something, um, they're suing somebody or they're getting sued and so it ends up in tribal court. So it may not be a tribe, it might be an entity, it might be an employee. So it just really varies. But uh, it's important to understand that the tribe can also extend to its its um, instrumentalities. What is Indian country? If you look at 18 U.S.C. 1151, Indian country is a term of art, and it's described as all lands within the limits of any Indian reservation that's under the jurisdiction of the United States, um, regardless if there's a patent or a right of way. Um, next is a dependent Indian communities within the borders of the United States, um, whether within the original or subsequent acquired territory. Next is all Indian allotments, and the title to which have not been distinguished, including rights of way. And so you'll see that it seems simple enough reading through these, but there has been a lot of court cases um, discussing and defining what exactly these are. So it all just depends, and that's why the government, the land status are all very important when, when looking at jurisdiction. So moving on to when you might find yourself in a tribal court. Uh, we have when a crime happens in Indian country. So I have three small slides about crime in Indian country, which does not do it justice. But again, this is just an overview um, a basic overview of when you might find yourself in tribal court. Um, criminal jurisdiction uh, can get or is very complicated. Um, you can you'll ask yourself, does this belong in tribal court? Does this belong in federal court? Does it belong in both? Or does it only belong in state? Um, and so criminal jurisdiction is very dependent on the Indian status of the perpetrator and the victim as well as the type of the crime that has been committed. Um, furthermore, if you do find yourself in a tribal court, tribal courts may vary in their jurisdiction as well as their sentencing authority. Uh, for example, you have the Tribal Law and Order Act, the TLOA, um, which has, cert has extended certain um, authority and jurisdiction for tribes um, to have an enhanced sentencing. But if a tribe opts into it, they have to follow certain rules um, in order to ensure that people's civil rights aren't being infringed upon. Um, the other example would be the Violence Against Women Act, which um, extends jurisdiction over non-Indians um, in certain instances um, where there's domestic violence. Um, and there's also a certain special relationship between the non-Indian perpetrator uh, and the Indian victim. Um, I won't go into those because I could have a whole um, presentation on those separate, but just know that what, if you find yourself in Indian country in a tribal court for a criminal act, um, the jurisdiction of that tribal court may vary. But here's um, a, a little um, matrix chart, if you will, that talks, that kind of tries to put, put it into perspective of what who has jurisdiction, um, you'll see that uh, the Indian status, there's an Indian perpetrator and an Indian victim. Um, depending on the type of crime, it can be uh, a federal, to have federal jurisdiction, um, and it can also have tribal jurisdiction. If a major crime hasn't been committed, um, it will fall solely upon tribal jurisdiction. So you'll see that the state doesn't become involved at all. Um, next, you'll see if there is an Indian perpetrator and a non-Indian victim, 
depending if it's a major crime, uh, it will fall within the federal jurisdiction and tribal jurisdiction. Um, you'll see that there is concurrent jurisdiction when um, there's an Indian perpetrator and there's a major crime that happens and there's no double jeopardy issues and that was um, decided in a previous court case. And you'll also see that if a major crime um, doesn't happen, uh, usually falls within the tribal jurisdiction. Uh, next, you'll see that if it's a non-Indian perpetrator and an Indian victim, uh, depending on if it's a general, a federal, a major crime, general crime, um, it will fall into the federal jurisdiction. If it's not um, all other crimes, it will fall under federal jurisdiction. And then you have um, whether it's a non-Indian perpetrator and a non-Indian victim, or there's a victimless crime, Usually it, it is state um, jurisdiction for any kind of crime, and that uh, falls in line with the Mitt and Bratney line of cases. And I took this from the uh, Tribal Court Clearinghouse. Um, that's a really good site that I didn't list it in the resources, so um, you might want to highlight that. That's a really good place to find a lot of resources about um, working in Indian country in um, federal Indian law, working with tribal courts and any kind of um, criminal laws in Indian country. So take note of that. So addressing criminal matters in tribal court, uh, again, criminal systems in Indian country are very similar to uh, how they play out in tribal court systems. Um, usually you'll have a tribal prosecutor or a police officer or some other presenting officer that's going to represent the tribe um, and present the case in court. Some tribal communities have public defenders or some kind of court advocate that would be available. Um, again, like I said, it just depends on what kind of authority or jurisdiction the tribe has, whether they're required or not to provide counsel, but um, a lot of communities um, do or don't, um, just really depends. And so if you find yourself in tribal court for a crime, uh, you, you'll need to inquire with the court whether a public defender is available to you or not at the Navajo Nation. And again, I'm going to use the Navajo Nation a lot just because that's where I practice most um, and that's where I come from before sex tyranny. Uh, at the Navajo Nation, um, they do provide public defenders. Uh, if there's a conflict, they usually pick out um, of a list of Navajo Nation Bar Association members to assign pro bono counsel. Um, so again, if you find yourself, ask the court if um, legal counsel is available, but you are entitled um, to have legal counsel. It's just a matter of whether um, you can you can get one from the tribe or if you have to pay out of pocket for one. Uh, next, we have defendants can obtain their own private counsel. As I said, usually it's out of pocket. So say you don't want to use a public defender, you want somebody or you know somebody that's able to help you and you trust them, uh, you, can, you can ask the court to have that person represent you. Um, but it's usually going to be an out-of-pocket cost for you. Um, however, if you do seek somebody, you need to keep in mind that some tribal courts will require that attorney to be admitted to practice in that tribal court. Um, here's just a handful of them that do require it in the Navajo Nation. You have to be a Navajo Nation Bar Association member, and um, that requires you taking a bar exam. Um, so it takes about a, I would say about a half a year to get barred in the Navajo Nation. Um, and currently, Navajo Nation doesn't allow Pro Hoc Vice. That was just more recent, I'd say within the past year that that rule, um, and I don't think it's been uh, lifted. Salt River, you have to be admitted to practice in that community. They do have Pro Hoc Vice um, admission. Uh, Gila River Indian Community, also John Otham Nation. So. You can practice in, in tribal courts, but check with the court to see if they have to be admitted um, to practice beforehand and whether they have pro hoc vice admission. Um, if, if you find yourself uh, representing yourself pro se, don't advise you to do it, but if you do find yourself um, representing yourself, uh, there are some basic steps that you should uh, complete. One would be reading the tribal criminal code that you are alleged to have violated. Um, locate, review, and follow any court rules. Um, you'll see if you practice outside of tribal courts, 
whether it's in a state court or federal court, there are certain rules for that particular court. And so you'll want to make sure that you understand those court rules. Next, you'll also want to make sure that you follow any timelines that have been set either um, by a code or by a rule or anything that's been um, put into an order. You will also want to make sure that the court and the prosecutors are abiding by timelines as well. Um, sometimes there are statutory requirements for how um, are the timelines for certain filings or when certain um, events must happen. So make sure that you're aware of those because those can help you um, if, if the tribe is not following it. And next you want to conduct discovery so that you can make sure that you have all the all the evidence that the other side is going to be used against you when it um, presents its case to the court. Um, check to see if there's an opportunity to plead. If you want to just plead this out, you may want to just check with the prosecutor to see if there's that option. Um, and then you can completely avoid going to trial. Um, next, you'll want to prepare, if that's not an option, you'll want to prepare for your case. So that would be reviewing police reports, finding whatever witnesses you need, and any, any other evidence that's going to help you in defending yourself against the prosecutor and their case in chief. Next, um, you'll want to submit motions if needed. You know, there might be some kind of jurisdictional issue um, that you see where now the tribe can't prosecute you. For example, um, do they even have jurisdiction over the person? Are you Native American? Do they, can they even prosecute you? Two, was the crime even committed in the tribal boundaries? Um, you can also attack the complaint. Was the complaint proper? Does it cite the correct um, code? provision? Um, does it fulfill all the requirements that are needed to be in the pleading? Um, and was there proper, ser proper service? Were you given service under um, the tribal laws? So you'll want to make sure that um, the tribe and the prosecutor has done everything that they're supposed to do, because if they don't, um, that's one way that you can uh, motion to dismiss the case against you. Uh, next, you have um, attend all your events so tribes in the criminal context do things um, a little differently. Some of them um, group the initial appearance and the arraignment together, um, and they'll present uh, a plea right there. So it's kind of take it's like the best deal they're going to give you, so you should take it there or not. Uh, you'll want to just make sure that you attend everything, though. Um, and if you need counsel, you think you're in over your head or you're not able to do this, you don't go ahead and uh, tell the judge that you want to request counsel and they'll um, take that and uh, reset your hearing. Um, you also want to attend all the hearings um, and be prepared for them and finally show up to your trial because if you don't, there'll be a judgment against you or even worse, not even worse, but equally worse that is you'll have a bench warrant out for your arrest. So we want to make sure that we're attending all events, making sure that the court has your most recent information um, so that they can provide service to you. Uh, and then finally, to round it all out, the tribe slash prosecutor is the one with the burden of proof to demonstrate that you have committed a crime um, within their jurisdiction. And so a defendant is defending itself against the prosecutor um, saying that they committed a crime. Again, this is very general. Um, there's a lot of um, particulars that happen throughout the criminal case, but this is just the basic overview of how a, a criminal case goes through the system. Um, what I didn't put on here is if in the end there's an issue and there, something happened in, in one of the hearings or in the trial where now you need a um, uh, you want to appeal, you can go ahead and do that. And each court, um, tribal government, Court has its own appellate process. I didn't add that in there because that's really um, specific, but you'll want to, if you're going to appeal a criminal matter, you need to look at those appellate rules to see what's um, appealable and what, who has the authority to appeal because um, some tribes, they can't appeal if they lose in a criminal uh, context. So you'll want to pay attention to um, the appeals if you get to that stage of a criminal matter. And then finally, um, before I went to law school, I was a victim advocate, and so um, this is an area that kind of gets left out a lot, but if you find yourself um, being a victim 
of the crime in Indian country. Some tribes do have victims' rights ordinances. Um, these are usually geared to protect the rights of victims. Um, for example, the right to be present at hearings, uh, to be, be free of harassment from the perpetrator or their family or, the, or the, um, their defense attorney. Um, to, I'm sorry, I have a typo. To be informed of um, a perpetrator's release so if they're getting out on bail or they've finished their time, whatever it is, um, you'll want to be informed. And so there, there's a rule or a regulation that they have to um, inform the person that is a victim of their release. Um, you'll see this a lot in domestic violence cases um, where a perpetrator is being released and the victim um, wants to be informed of that so that they can do you know, safety planning or just be aware or avoid places, whatever it is. Um, and there's other provisions. Um, if you find yourself a victim of crime in any country, um, there's resources available. You just have to look for them. Um, if a major crime has been committed, and so if there's like a, a homicide and, and you're a surviving um, family member of that homicide, uh, you can find a victim advocate to help you. Um, if you're a victim, a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, any of those enumerated crimes, there's about 14 of them. Um, there is usually a federal victim advocate that's available um, to help you with resources. Um, if you're a victim to a crime and it's subject to tribal court jurisdiction, um, you, you can, and it doesn't have to, it could be also be a federal crime. Um, just depends on who you want to use. There might be a tribal program that can help you through the criminal process um, and other issues that are related to the victimization. Uh, for example, in Gila River, they have the Crime Victim Services Program, and they are geared towards uh, domestic violence and sexual assault, but they also help other crimes that take place within the Gila River Indian community. And so victim advocates um, can really be, play a, a vital role because prosecutors you know, have a huge caseload um, and they want to get these out um, and prosecuted. And so some of the, the effects of victimization don't get addressed. For example, I just use domestic violence. Um, you now have a person that needs a protective order. Now you need somebody that needs counseling because of the domestic violence. You need somebody that you have somebody that needs safety planning because of the domestic violence. You lost your car or you, something happened and now you need some kind of compensation. Some counties provide victims compensation um, if, you, if you're victimized in that county. Um, so you, you'll want to see if that's available in your county. Also, you know, if you need transportation to court um, and want to be there, you know, they can also provide that. And they can also provide other referral sources for like food banks or shelters and clothing assistance. And so, um, Victim right, victims usually get overlooked, but uh, victim advocates can play a really vital role in, in helping navigate a tribal court system in a tribal criminal case. Next, um, we have doing business in Indian country. This, this happens a lot, and this is kind of the area that I practice a lot in, um, being that I uh, help tribes conduct business um, with outside entities. A lot of times, tribes um, need outside sources for uh, material or goods or services and so you'll see a lot of times tribal entities and tribal government and then a dispute happens where they end up in court. Um, sometimes it's federal court just depending on the instrument um, and the relationship. But um, you'll want to understand that many tribes have their own business laws. For example, there's preferential hiring for tribal members, um, American Indians or spouses of tribal members. Um, you'll, the tribes might have their own procurement laws and regulations. And again, just because I work there, the Navajo Nation has a huge, um, they, they have a tribal code and they have procurement laws and they have regulations that you have to follow just to get a contract through the system. Um, and that's the way they keep accountability. It might be a long drawn out process, but it works for the nation and, and if you're doing business, those are some of the rules you have to understand um, when you're doing business. Next, some tribes require entities coming onto the um, reservation to have certain business licenses to conduct business um, within the reservation. And uh, taxes, if you conduct business 
on a tribal reservation and the tribe has a tax um, requirement, you'll be required to pay taxes to the tribe for conducting business. Um, and then, you know, tribes carry out a lot of their business activity through different entities. Um, the nature of the entity will affect its, your legal rights as well as your remedies that are available to non-Indian parties as well as Indian parties. Um, and so here are just a few types of entities that a tribe may use um, when it's conducting business. It might just be flat out the tribe itself. Um, it could be a government instrumentality. Um, you know, it could be the, the chapter or the, the district of the nation, or it could be um, an LLC that the tribe uh, created under tribal law. Um, you also have Section 17 corporations, and that's under the Indian Reorganization Act. You don't see those a lot, but they do exist. Uh, you also have a tribal entity, which again could be, you know, a, the tribe's housing um, department. It could be the tribe's um, nursing authority. I, it just depends. Um, next, you have a tribally chartered corporation. I spoke about that a little earlier. And then sometimes tribes uh, will create an, or, an organization or a corporation under state law um, because it provides certain benefits. And so it just really varies. And again, that's a whole other topic um, that you could spend another session on. But these are some of the more general um, types of entities that you'll see when conducting business in Indian country. If you're doing business in Indian country, whether you're um, a tribal member or non-tribal, it's really important to know what entity that you are dealing with and what entity you're contracting with and to understand whether that entity has the authority to enter into business with you. Um, you'll see a lot of times um, some person might you know, try to enter into a contract with somebody else. Really important to make sure that you know that you are work who you're working with and whether they have the authority to enter into those um, types of transactions. Um, business transactions uh, that land in tribal court, um, if the tribe lands in tribal court, um, you'll want to remember that certain government entities are protected by sovereign immunity. Um, this basically you can't sue a sovereign unless they allow themselves to be sued in court. Um, that will require a waiver, um, but those waivers have to be clear. Um, they also have to be un undertaken by the entity with the authority to waive that sovereign immunity. So let's use an example. Um, tribe A has a sub-entity, um, and that sub-entity want wants to enter into a contract with a supplier, um, and the supplier is requesting, because they know about the sovereign immunity, they say, hey, we want you to waive it so that you can be sued in court. Um, the entity doesn't have that, that ability um, to enter into it. So if that's the case, they have to go to the tribe to ask for um, a waiver of sovereign immunity. Um, sometimes um, an entity can be granted or delegated the ability to um, waive some of the sovereign immunity. That can be a lim limited waiver. Um, but regardless, it's important to make sure that, that whatever entity you're dealing with has the authority to enter into that waiver, has the authority to enter into that contract um, so that you don't find yourself um, out of luck and without a remedy. And so again, what law governs um, for non-Indian contractors working on the reservation, tribal law is going to apply, except um, in Montana, the Montana versus the United States Supreme Court held Indian tribes lack civil authority over the conduct of non-Indians on non-Indian fee land, um, except for in what we call the two Montana exceptions. One is that a tribe may regulate through taxation, licensing, and other means activities of non-members who enter into, and this is important, consensual relationships through commercial dealings, contracts, leases, and other arrangements with the tribe or its members, or to um, where the conduct um, has some kind of effect, some kind of effect on the tribe's political integrity, economic security, or health or welfare. And again, there's a lot of case law out there that discusses the Montana exceptions. And so, if you have a client or representing a client, um, or or you have a client that is the tribal entity, you'll want to understand um, when the tribe may have civil jurisdiction 
over a non-Indian entity. Um, if the contractor has a contract with the Indian tribe for performance within the reservation, the tribe's going to have the power to regulate the activities, which includes licensing, taxing, and adjudicating disputes. But again, um, look at that case law to see what the exact requirements are, whether there's a rule or an exception. So um, that's just part of lawyering, lawyering in Indian country. Um, next, we have family law issues in Indian country. And again, this is another huge area of law that you, um, that's, that's practiced in Indian country. Um, tribes have their own laws regarding domestic relations or how they um, handle children and custody of children. Um, but here's just a few examples of some of the laws that govern these domestic relationships and, and children, marriage, divorce and separation, um, getting protection orders, child custody orders, banishment, guardianship, and the list goes on and on and on and on of why you find yourself in a family court or civil court. Um, the processes, the laws, and the remedies are going to vary from tribe to tribe just based on um, what the tribe has adopted or not. Sometimes the tribe will follow traditional laws over any kind of common law or codified law. Um, for example, uh, let's use the Tonopah Nation versus the Navajo Nation with regard to banishment. So on the Tonopah Nation, um, banishment is permissible and the, the government the nation um, allows its districts, which are, you can, you can equate them to um, counties, if you will, if you look at it in the state county relationship versus a tribe um, district relationship. The nation allows the districts to, um, ha to basically deal with uh, matters of local concern um, and banishment is one of them. And so uh, the nation um, allows them to to deal with it how they want to, whereas the Navajo Nation, um, it's not really it's not called banishment. I forget exactly what it's called, but the court um, has a has it on their website of how you exclude people from entering the Navajo Nation, and that requires notice and due process, um, allowing them to uh, present their case in court. Um, and so you can just see how the two different systems are. Of regarding banishment are different um, and so whatever issue you're dealing with it's it's really important to make sure that you understand um, that tribe's rules and laws and process um, as well as whether they follow a traditional way of dealing with things or not um, you'll see a lot on the Navajo Nation what they call fundamental law where um, they look to the, the nations or the Navajo traditional natural law um, and uh, that outweighs anything that's codified or any kind of um, judge-made law. Um, and you'll see this in some of the family court cases and um, you'll see it in some of the probate court uh, cases as well where um, fundamental law trumps everything else. Um, tribal laws and court opinions are usually um, searchable. You can usually find them on the tribe's website or within the tribe's um, court website. Um, sometimes if you have Westlaw, um, some of the, the reporters have those cases, um, but usually it's usually the tribal court that will cat um, that will report their, their cases and have them available to you. Um, again, make sure that you're reading the most recent code or rule. Um, laws are always being changed and so it's really important that you make sure you're reading the most recent so that you're um, presenting the law to the court um, as it is at the time. Uh, generally for civil matters um, your entire court process is going to begin with a petition and that petition uh, asks the court to do something or to make something happen and it will provide the reasons why you're asking for it and uh, informing the court of their ability to be able to grant whatever it is that the petitioner is asking. Again, you'll want to look at the tribal court or the tribe's civil rules regarding what needs to be um, in a petition for a particular matter because what's necessary for a petition for a protective order is different from what's going to be um, in a petition for guardianship. So just make sure that you know um, what you need to put in that petition. 
Um, because a lot of people in Indian country can't afford attorneys, um, courts try to make it user friendly for people to represent themselves. And so you can find um, you can find uh, fillable forms for both the petitioner and a respondent, as long as as well as instructions. Um, you just got to look or go to the court and ask if that's a, a form that they have. Sometimes they have a general form um, that you can use and just hand write in. Again, it just really depends on the court um, and their rules and what they're willing to accept. Courts get it. A lot of people don't have internet. They don't have computers, so they can't download a file and you know type it up. So they'll take a handwritten petition. Um, so just, just make sure that you're, you're adding what needs to be in that petition. But um, if you need assistance, it's really important that you contact an attorney or a tribal court advocate to help you. And again, I'll give you some resources at the end um, where you can look to for help. Uh, it's important to remember that courts can't instruct you, um, they can't assist you, and they can't advise you. Um, that's, that's reserved for attorneys or court advocates. Um, probate law in Indian country, again, this is one of those areas that can get really complicated really quickly depending on what's involved. Um, a lot of American Indians have off-reservation property, they have tangible property, they have accounts, um, they have uh, restricted property such as those held in trust or allotted lands, um, and they may also receive income from those um, restricted lands. Uh, you'll see this a lot in, in some of those tribes like Oklahoma have a lot of a lot of land out there. Um, probate issues again become very complicated um, due to the status of the land, um, other property status, the issues with airship, um, tribal customs can become um, involved, and whether the person has a will or not, um, and whether the tribe has a probate code or not. And so again, I've left this really general because um, it, it just depends on the particulars of the tribe of how they do things with regard to probate court. One thing to remember is tribal courts can't probate off-reservation property. For example, if you have a house in Flagstaff, if you have a house in Phoenix, um, you know your respective tribal court can't say, "Oh yes, you, you we're gonna we're gonna um, award that to so and so." That kind of probate goes through state court because that's where the the property is located um, outside of tribal jurisdiction. Uh, tribal jurisdiction for probate purposes is limited to territorial boundaries um, and oftentimes require have residency requirements or um, enrollment requirements. So you'll, again, you'll just have to look at the probate code if there is one and see what are the requirements to have something um, adjudicated in the tribe's probate court. Um, sometimes federal probate is required um, especially if you have, like, for example, if you have allotted land in Oklahoma, but you're um, a tribal member in New Mexico, uh, and you have a um, grazing right, you know, some that stuff in Oklahoma can't be probated in Navajo court. That's going to have to be probated um, in CFR court. So again, really particular, um, very circumstance. Um, uh, circumstances matter, and so you'll want to make sure that you understand everything that's happening, the status of all the property in, um, involved, um, who's surviving, who's not, um, and whether there's a will or not. Uh, probate usually begins with the petitioner asking again for the court to disperse the decedent's property um, with or without a will. If there's a will, you usually attach it and it goes through. Um, if not, it will go through. Um, the laws of intestacy, but in its most basic form, it begins with an executor being appointed to handle kind of the closing out of that decedent's estate, um, notice being sent out to the interested parties that, they're, hey, there's going to be a probate happening, um, this is your time to bring issues before the court, um, and it's also a time for people to contest um, certain provisions in the will or um, if there's somebody that, you know, undo, there was undue influence on the person because there was um, a will with everything left to the ex-wife. I mean, it, it just really gets crazy, um, but there's a time for you to contest those. Um, a hearing will happen where you present evidence, you, you explain to the court what's going on, why this person's not entitled to that, or why you're entitled to something, um, why certain properties shouldn't be probated in this court, whatever it is, 
Um, and there's usually motion writing that's involved as well. Um, and then usually an order is uh, presented or is issued by the judge that determines how things are to be devised. Uh, and sometimes if, if there's an issue, it can be appealed and it will go to the higher appellate courts if there is an appellate process. Um, when dealing with probate issues, you must be mindful that death is usually a sensitive topic in tribal communities. And because of that, um, estate planning might not be practiced as widely as it is outside of Indian country. Um, and just to round this out, other considerations when you're working in tribal court, um, do you need an interpreter? A lot of times the judge, um, your witnesses, uh, speak in their native tongue and so if you have a, a grandma that witnessed something and she doesn't speak English you need to make sure that that witness can be able to explain things to the court and whether an interpreter is needed or not. Uh, next you'll find yourself um, finding tribal laws, opinions, or other forms might not be that easy. Um, you know a lot of times tribal governments are working with um, limited resources and so having a person to always be updating a website or uploading forms or it, um, releasing opinions might not happen as fast as they do stateside um, so it's just important to be patient and to ask for help or you know just do some really quality research um, for your client or to find these these things they're out there it's just a matter of finding them Paper filing is the norm. A lot of times you will not see e-filing like you do in state courts. Um, some courts might accept fax or emails. Um, it's just important to inquire with the court clerk or the rules to see if that's allowable. Uh, sometimes tribal courts will adopt laws from other jurisdictions, especially if there's no tribal law or rule or case law on point. Um, for example, if there's an evidence rule that hasn't been adopted, or that isn't addressed in the tribal rules because a lot of them are outdated, um, they may have a overarching rule saying if we don't have something on point, you can use this authority or you can use this authority. Um, sometimes tribes will adopt other tribal um, laws. Uh, I know if there's something like traditional, um, they might adopt a neighboring tribe's uh, case on that and, and use the same reasoning. So just important to know the um, hierarchy of authority, um, whether there's traditional natural fundamental law and customs, whether they trump everything else. Um, knowing that the tribe has a constitution or not, or if the tribe has a code, um, or if the tribe has a treaty, it just depends on that authority and you'll want to be mindful of, of how it lines up in the hierarchy. Um, you have codified and common law, and then you have state laws that sometimes might be adopted, just depending. Um, finally, uh, the way things that are the way things done in tribal court might not be the same in a different tribal court. So if you practice in Navajo a lot, just know that if you go to have a supai, it's probably not going to be the same. Um, they're probably going to have a different process. It might be re more relaxed. It might be uh, more formal. So it's really important to kind of know know what context you're working in. So uh, here are just a few legal resources for people. Um, the Navajo Nation Bar Association has a list of um, attorneys that practice in Navajo courts. Uh, there's DNA, People's Legal Services in Windrock, and they have several satellite offices throughout the nation. Four Rivers Indian Legal Services, um, that's located in Gila, around Gila River. Um, a lot of the, the Southern Arizona tribes will use those. Um, ASU Indian Legal Clinic, they're a good resource if you have an issue and you just really don't know where to turn or, or where to find something or if you just have a client that you can't help. Um, they, they're a good resource to help you find and point you in the right direction. Um, sometimes they will take a case um, if it's in tribal court and it's a, a really unique issue, um, they might take your case and help you. Um, so you'll want to look at, call them. And there's other community legal services available. One of them is Native Health of Phoenix. Um, you have to be a client, but sometimes um, they'll, they'll, they'll have uh, free legal help available for you. Uh, for your bigger Native law issues, NARF has a good um, collection of resources for people working in Indian country um, and what, what things are, where you can find laws. 
um, and you know some user guides. So NARC is a really good um, resource. You have law libraries throughout the state. Um, schools have li right, libraries. Um, courthouses have libraries. So you'll just want to look into those and see if you're able to look into that. Um, finally, the State Bar of Arizona has what they call find a lawyer. So if you need a lawyer that works in Indian country, um, you know, they, they have like a fields where you can insert Indian law or something and it will bring up anybody that has Indian law attached to their to their um, Arizona bar. Um, here's my contact information again. I work with Sachs Tierney. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well.